he was sadistic and not only enjoyed murdering these people who were literally just given to him, but he also liked to torture them. Josef had no limits. At one point, he took two twins and he actually stitched them together. The experiments that Josef decided to conduct were not scientific, they were not accurate, and they were not ethical. This is Humans, true stories about the most intriguing parts of human behavior. The good, the bad, and the downright horrific. If you know anything about the TV show American Horror Story, you probably know about the second season, Asylum, which is set in Briarcliff Manor, which is a mental asylum. There are a number of really disturbing things that happen in this season. I love it. I think it's a really good TV show. But one of the storylines is based on this real life person um, in the TV show. He's called Dr. Arthur Arden. In real life, he was called Dr. Joseph Mengele. And the character in the TV show, Dr. Arthur Arden, he is a Nazi war criminal and he sets himself up at Briarcliff Manor many years after the Second World War. And he sets himself up there as a physician. And when patients would come to him when they were physically ill, he would pretend that they died of natural causes but actually he would keep them alive and he'd conduct these horrific experiments on them for the next few days, weeks and months. And this would include things like amputations and lobotomy procedures. It was really, really horrific stuff. And this sounds like an American big budget Hollywood horror franchise, which is exactly what it is. But the real story, the reality of this, what Josef Mengele did was so much worse. And to set up what life was really like when Josef was around, we have to go back to 1940 when Auschwitz concentration camp was uh, established in a Polish city called Oschwenschin. And for the 10 years before Auschwitz was created or established as a concentration camp, the Nazis had actually been setting up concentration camps all around, and by 1945, there were already 1,000. Hitler and his horrible little minions sent anyone to these camps who they deemed to be outsiders or criminals. And not to mention, lots of these people that were heading there that were cast as criminals were only doing so because it was literally a necessity. The Nazis had taken away their homes, they'd taken away any form of income, and they had to steal, for example, to survive. But on top of those kinds of people, there were also people with disabilities, physical and mental, and also anyone who was Jewish was sent there, amongst many, many other people. Auschwitz was specifically established because there were lots and lots of Polish people being arrested and they wouldn't actually fit in the prisons that had already been established. So they built Auschwitz as this sort of secondary place to bring those people. And all in all, this one camp held 15,000 people, but in reality, it actually held up to 20,000 people. And then the second part of Auschwitz held over 90,000 people. The prisoners would usually be taken to camp by a train or truck or on foot and it was likely that they didn't know the full extent of where they were heading to or what awaited them but they had heard rumours and the level of fear and anxiety must have been absolutely unbearable waiting just to be taken to what they could only consider as likely their deaths. Even the journey to camp was horrific. It usually took days and days and many, many people would be crammed onto these buses or trucks or trains, and they wouldn't be told exactly what was going on. But bearing in mind these journeys lasted for days, there was no water, there was no food, and there were no toilet facilities. These vehicles often smell of urine, of sick, and of excrement. And it wasn't uncommon on these journeys for people to literally die of suffocation or dehydration or starvation. And then when they finally did arrive, 
there was this desperate scramble to get off of these trucks or trains that they've been transported on. But any sort of faint sense of relief or hope that they had quickly faded when they saw what was waiting for them. And that was a man standing, literally telling them whether to go left or right. And if you went right, you were deemed to be fit enough to work. You could do hard labour. And this was mainly men, although occasionally was older children or sometimes women as well. And then you were sent forward to register. And registering was basically a process whereby you would get given a prisoner number and it was actually tattooed onto your arm when you were in Auschwitz. And from that point on, you weren't referred to by your name ever again. You were only referred to by your number. Then you'd be forced to get undressed. You'd have your head shaved and then you'd be sent in to have a shower. And when you came out, after you'd showered in these cold, freezing cold showers with hundreds or thousands of other people that had just arrived, you'd then be given your uniform, which often was a blue and white striped uniform. But it did depend on which camp you went to as to what that would look like. Men wore trousers and a jacket and a cap and women were given a dress or skirt and had this sort of material that they could put over their heads. They'd also wear leather or wooden clogs but they would have bare feet inside of these shoes and without any sort of socks or anything like that, they'd often get blisters and sores and what in usual circumstances wouldn't be massively difficult to deal with. In these circumstances, those sores and blisters would often get infected and obviously there wasn't the medical treatment available at outfits and so people would often die just from having blisters and that clothing that they wore was not only demeaning in terms of uh, lacking any kind of identity, but also in the freezing cold winter months, these people were in these really, really thin material clothing and it was completely inappropriate for that weather. And often people would freeze to death. And for the other 75% of people who were brought in and sorted to the left on that walk in, that was usually women or children or the elderly or disabled, they were sent straight to the gas chamber. And obviously the guards didn't wanna worry people. They didn't want to cause a sense of panic so that they wouldn't be able to control these people. So when they were being sent to the gas chamber, usually they'd be told that they were just going to have a shower and they'd walk into this chamber, the doors would be locked behind them and within seconds, they'd be dead and then their bodies were taken and incinerated. The whole of Auschwitz could support the murder of up to 20,000 people in a single day if it worked with incredible efficiency and absolutely no mercy. I read somewhere that upon being selected for extermination, your life expectancy from that point was just two hours. Auschwitz had 20 brick buildings at the start and they were separated into two parts. So there were 14 that were single storey and six that were double storey. And they were originally meant to house 700 people, but in reality, they ended up housing up to 1200 people. And inside these brick buildings, there were straw mattresses, which were on the sort of concrete floor and it was so overly crowded that people had no choice but they would literally have to sleep on their sides together and fortunately this did help in terms of heat and keeping themselves warm but obviously disease was spread very very easily this way and then on the bottom floor of these buildings there were toilet facilities and what that meant was a row of 22 holes and that was pretty much it um, and some wash basins and also 22 toilets essentially for 1200 people is just not adequate enough and so people ended up having to go to the toilet in their beds and where they would sleep. The living conditions of these facilities were horrific and there were lice and rats and obviously disease was spread very very easily and epidemics of contagious diseases happened all of the time. Even bathing was a source of death for some people because they'd have to strip off in their 
in their buildings, in the blocks that they would sleep in. And then they'd have to walk across to the bathing houses. And it's often freezing and wet conditions. So that obviously leads to sickness. And in most cases, that led to death. The average day would involve being woken up at 4.30 a.m. and they'd be woken up by this gong sound and then they'd wash in whatever way they could but there's no soap and there's mainly dirty water so that's what they'd be washing with. They wouldn't be able to get dry properly. They'd put their clothes back on and then they'd hear a second gong, which would signify that it was time for roll call. And the prisoners would be counted to make sure that the numbers added up. And then they'd start their day of labour. And labour could be anything from hard labour like construction to secretarial work to wearing shoes and testing out the soles of shoes, to even sorting the possessions of the new arrivals that had just come in. And the prisoners were forced to walk to wherever they were working that day. And that might be within the camp, but it also could be a few kilometres away. And they were doing this on very little food and very little water. And the food that they did have were things like stale bread or porridge or soup, there was a lot of soup. So they were mainly taking in little bits of liquid and occasionally bits of solid food. And then were having to work for 11 hour days. So that was your average day in Auschwitz, horrific and completely merciless. And so on arrival, you'd be met by this man telling you to go either left or right. And if you arrived in 1943 or later, the chances are, you'd be met by this man, enthusiastic, well-dressed, Josef Mengele. Josef was originally assigned as a medical officer, but he took absolute pride in volunteering for extra duties. Many of the doctors tasked with sorting the incoming prisoners found it quite draining and didn't necessarily want to do it, but Josef absolutely did. There was power associated with this process, and Josef was particularly interested in singling out a specific type of person. Josef would select people he thought could help with his human experiment program. One morning, whilst Josef was attending his sorting duties, he looked down the track and he saw a guard trying to pry apart a mother and daughter. And the mother actually scratched the guard in trying to pull her 14 year old daughter back to her. Now Josef saw this and he walked up to them and in his calm and controlled manner, he shot both of them dead. This had caused him some inconvenience and he was pretty pissed off. So he decided to stop the selection process there and ordered that everyone else that came in that day went straight to the gas chamber. He saw these thousands of people being shipped into Auschwitz every single day and so he thought well they're going to be killed anyway so why don't I use them to understand the secrets of heredity which is the passing of physical or mental characteristics genetically from one generation to the next. Joseph had previously worked for a biologist who had pioneered the methodology of using twins in the study of genetics. And he believed that the ideal Nazi future could be achieved through selective breeding that could be used to encourage what they deemed as the most acceptable types of behaviours and wipe out any undesirable tendencies. The experiments that Josef decided to conduct were not scientific, they were not accurate and they were not ethical. He had funding for these experiments and he was working with some of the top medical researchers of the time. But this alone wasn't the reason why he was looking forward to conducting these experiments. He was sadistic and not only enjoyed murdering these people who were literally just given to him, but he also liked to torture them. One afternoon, Josef and another doctor at the facility were having an argument. There had been this little boy who had come to them who they'd all actually grown quite fond of. And Josef said that he had tuberculosis and this other doctor said, no, he didn't. The doctor said there weren't the usual things that would suggest he had symptoms of TB, like um, a fever or a loss of appetite or chest pain. And Josef said, it, although he didn't have those symptoms, he did have other symptoms like loss of weight and a persistent cough. 
obviously is going to have those two things. He's literally being starved and left outside in the cold in outfits. But Joseph ignored that and said that he believed he had TB. Partway through that argument, Yosef stormed out of the room and he was gone for a couple of hours. And when he did come back in, he went straight up to the other doctor and he actually apologised. And he said, look, I'm really sorry, you were right. I don't think this, this child has TB um, and I'm sorry. And that was really, really bizarre. The doctor was sort of confused because Joseph did not apologise. That was not in his nature. And so he turned to Joseph and he asked why he thought he was wrong. And that's when Joseph said that in those few hours he'd been gone, he'd taken the boy, he'd shot him at point blank range, and then he dissected him and looked for signs of TB, of which there were none. Other than being malnourished and dehydrated, the boy was physically fine. And so a year after Joseph had come into the camp and he'd been doing these little bits of human experiments or autopsies after they died, he was then promoted up to a higher level where he would be responsible for all public health matters. And obviously not like the actual health of these prisoners because they don't want them to die. They didn't care about that, but more so because they wanted enough prisoners to be able to do this hard labour and all of the work that they had. So they needed to make sure there wasn't an outbreak of any sort of disease or something that would wipe out a huge number of the prisoners. And with tens of thousands of people packed tightly into these concrete structures, the outbreak of daily diseases was sort of inevitable. And it wasn't long before Joseph's promotion to this public health advisor role that there was a breakout of typhus in one of the women's blocks. Typhus is an infectious disease that can be spread by lice and fleas, and it can be deadly. Symptoms can include a fever, a rash and headaches. With this breakout of typhus being this first moment for Joseph in his new job role, he thought he'd use it to prove himself. He ordered the block to be fumigated, and so the 600 women were told to leave their their concrete block and they were taken down to the other side of the camp where the gas chamber was and they were taken straight to be killed. This process was repeated until all of the women's blocks had been fumigated and every single woman that was on the camp at that time had been taken to the gas chamber and killed. And a few months later when there was an outbreak of scarlet fever Joseph did exactly the same thing. So back to the experiments he was conducting and this utter fascination he had with twins. He was particularly interested in using identical twins because they have exactly the same genes. So they're the perfect candidates for having one as a control factor and the other as a sort of monitoring, contrasting factor. So he would wait at the entrance and see the new arrivals come in and amongst his sorting duties he'd constantly be on the lookout in case there were twins coming in and he was also looking for anyone else with unique hereditary traits so people with dwarfism or giantism or anyone with two different eye colors and when he saw any of these kinds of people come in including twins he'd barge past everyone else he'd get very excited and he'd pull them to the front of the queue He'd often spend time when he was off or just not supposed to be on sorting duty. He'd often come up and stand by the guards who were doing sorting duty and sort of look out to this sea of thousands of people to see if he could try and find any of those people with unique hereditary elements. And during this process, the guards would shout out and say that any twins should come forward. But mothers, especially with their, their young children who were twins, had to make a decision very quickly. They didn't know whether being a twin was, was going to help or it was going to hinder them. They didn't know if it was better to admit to being a twin or to keep quiet. That decision could be the difference for them between life and death. And of course, there was no easy decision or even a right decision to make. If you pretended that you weren't a twin or if you weren't discovered you somehow managed to get through then you would most likely be sent with your mother 
to the gas chamber. And if you did admit to being a twin or if you were discovered, you'd be given over to Yosef. And what he did was essentially just prolonged torture before death. Altogether, a little over 3,000 twins, mainly children, were given over to Yosef. And at first, it might appear as if you've made the right decision in speaking up or being discovered as a twin, because whilst everyone else was going to get processed, you were actually taken by the man Yosef himself. And he told you to call him Uncle Pappy, and he took you to a special area. He often let you keep your own clothes. You didn't have to shave your head. And he'd even bring chocolates and sweets and give them to these twins. And in some ways, things were very similar in that the twins were taken to their own concrete block and it was full of twins, but it was very much the same in terms of being very basic and very difficult in terms of survival. There wasn't much in there. And over the first couple of days that you were there, you were told to fill in a form and it was very basic stuff. It would have your height and your age and maybe some measurements as well. And actually a lot of the time, the twins that were taken away from their mothers were not old enough to fill in these forms themselves. They either couldn't write or they just didn't understand. And so there was an inmate who had been brought in earlier um, in the process and they were assigned to looking after the twins as best they could and filling in these forms and bringing them to Yosef in the morning. But to be honest, Yosef was very hands-on and he was excited about the potential of these twins. So he'd often visit those blocks once or twice every single day. And when he arrived, more often than not, the children were actually glad to see him they would be met with this person who they called Uncle Pappy and he'd often have these chocolates or sweets to give them to sort of entice them into trusting him. And they weren't made to do hard labour or be subjected to these random sorting procedures where they could end up in a gas chamber. And sometimes they were even allowed to play football for minutes, hours, sometimes even days or weeks would pass and these twins would think, maybe we're safe. But early each morning, a truck would come by to the twins block and pick up a number of twins and take them to the labs for experimenting. So the twins would arrive and immediately they would be sent to one of the rooms. And the procedures varied massively. In an attempt to manufacture blue eyes, Josef would actually inject things into their eyes. And this would obviously not only be incredibly painful, but it often would cause severe infection and temporary or permanent blindness. He would conduct massive blood transfusions from one twin to another. He would also inject one twin with infections like TB or typhus. And then he would leave the other twin alone and he'd sort of monitor their progress. Now, if this twin that was infected did pass away from that illness, he would just immediately kill the other twin and then compare their autopsies. Twins would also have their limbs painfully clamped so tightly that they'd actually get gangrene and have to be amputated. And they were subjected to not only amputation, but also castration and removal of certain organs. And all of this was done without anesthesia. One survivor clearly remembers walking into one of the labs and being met with a wall of different colored eyes. She said she felt like they were all staring at her and she began to feel quite sick. She and her sister on another occasion were forced into this small wooden cage and they had injections put into their back. One set of injections was intended to cause Noma disease, which is an infection of the mouth or genitals and actually causes boils and usually leads to gangrene. Joseph had no limits. At one point, he took two twins and he actually stitched them together. He tried to make Siamese twins by stitching their backs together. And obviously, just a few days later, after getting severe gangrene, they did pass away. He also forcefully impregnated one of the women, young women at this camp, on the hope that she would give birth to twins. And during her pregnancy, he was 
really kind to her. He fed her well. He made sure she was sort of well looked after. And then when she gave birth to one baby and not another, he literally ripped the baby away from her and threw it into an oven and then walked away. Another horrific birth story that involves Joseph is when a young woman who was already pregnant gave birth at the camp and Joseph forced this young mother to have her breasts bandaged up so that she couldn't actually feed the baby. And the purposes of this, he said, was that he wanted to see how long it would take for a newborn to die if they weren't being fed. Spoiler alert, it's not very long. So the young mother tried as much as she could to feed the baby and she got these half chewed pieces of bread. She put them in linen that she'd soaked in coffee and she tried to feed the baby. But obviously this wasn't enough, it wasn't adequate, it wasn't nutritional. And just a few days later, the baby stopped crying and it had died. During Joseph's time there, two twin girls, Eva and Miriam, arrived at the camp. They arrived there with their mum, dad and two sisters. And immediately one of the guards spotted these two young girls and saw that they looked very similar. So the guard asked the mum if they were twins. And this was that moment, that really tricky decision that their mum had to make. She didn't know whether to say yes, they were twins and was that a good thing? Or no, they're not twins, they're just sisters and they look really similar. So she did all she could think of and she put her faith in the guard and asked, is that a good thing? He just nodded and then went to pull the twins away from her. Both Miriam and Eva were terrified and as they were pulled away from their mother, they were kicking and screaming and they got further and further away and they saw in the distance their father and two sisters being led to the right, to the labour side of the camp. And they saw their mother being led to the left, which was the gas chamber side. And they actually never saw any of their family members ever again. The girls were taken straight to the twins block. And just a few hours later, as was the case with most of the twins, they were taken for their measurements. And this involved them being stripped naked and sitting for eight hours in this cold room being measured every single part of their bodies were measured and compared to one another. Just a few weeks into her time in Auschwitz, Eva actually was injected with a substance, she didn't know what it was, but very quickly she began to feel really unwell and she started shaking and she had a fever. And then just a few hours later, she noticed her legs and her arms started to feel numb and they were getting bigger and bigger and becoming more swollen. And it eventually got to the point where she couldn't move. And she was in and out of consciousness during this time. And one time when she, when she sort of woke up, she opened her eyes and she saw Joseph standing at the end of her bed. And he said to another doctor, oh, it's too bad. It's a shame she's so young. She's got two weeks left to live. Never mind. And then he walked away. And Eva was made to spend her last few weeks in this block which was meant for the people that were dying and she was there with many other very very sick unwell people and she kept waking up part way through the day and night and although she felt incredibly unwell and couldn't move she would force herself along the floor crawling and dragging herself across just so she could get to this fountain of water so that she could keep fluids in her. She knew how important that was even at her young age. And then she would crawl back to bed and fall asleep and in and out of consciousness. And then after two weeks had passed, she was still doing this and she was still alive. And then another day passed and another day passed and eventually she got to the three week mark and she began to feel a little bit better and she knew she was going to survive. She said that in her head she knew she had to because if she died, her twin sister would immediately be killed as well. Once Eva was healthy enough to join Miriam, she and her twin sister were subjected to the same routine they had been before she'd become unwell. And this meant that on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, they would have their arms tightly tied so that their blood flow would be restricted and they'd have blood taken from one arm 
and into the other arm they'd have five injections of substances that they didn't know what they were and the doctors would then just see what the effects would be on each twin. Altogether, Eva and Miriam were there for nine months until the Allies invaded the surrounding areas. And on realising this, the Nazis began to destroy everything. And firstly, they brought all of the prisoners that they could into the gas chambers to kill them. And then they started destroying the gas chambers themselves. Now, because Eva and Miriam were twins, they weren't actually taken to the gas chamber and they were alive when soldiers came into their camp and gathered up as many prisoners as they could. The soldiers that had gathered them up at this point were the good guys and they gave them chocolates and sweets and then one of the soldiers bent down to the level that Miriam and Eva were at and asked them if he could give them a hug. They rushed to him and held him tight. It had been months since they'd felt any kind of kindness or warmth from anyone in a position that could help them. The girls were freed and they were sent with 180 other twins to a nearby orphanage. It's impossible to know what other experiments were conducted at Auschwitz because in 1945 most of those records were destroyed by the Nazis. A year after that, in 1946, a number of doctors were actually sentenced for their crimes, but Josef wasn't there. At the time the Allies had actually invaded Auschwitz, Josef had been gone for a few days. He knew they were coming, so he packed up his notes and escaped. He actually avoided capture until June, and then he was arrested, but because he didn't have the SS blood group tattooed on his arm, they actually let him go. It was only after he was gone that they looked at the list of war criminals and realised that his name was on it that they noticed they'd made such a huge mistake. He then went on to live in South America in hiding and in 1979 he died in Brazil. Family and friends after this, after his death, did admit to actually hiding him. The young twins, Eva and Miriam, did actually manage to make it through the next few weeks and days and years, and they lived relatively happy lives after Auschwitz. Although, of course, the memories stayed. And unfortunately for Miriam, things were even more tricky because she suffered some kidney issues. While she was at Auschwitz, she'd had an injection that had actually stopped the growth of one of her kidneys. And in 1993, she passed away due to complications from her kidney. Eva went on to open a museum in honour of her sister, Miriam. And Eva herself actually passed away in 2019. Before her death, she said that she actually forgave the Nazis for herself. Quote, Forgiveness is a seed for peace. Anger is a seed for war. Oh, I don't think I could be as strong as Eva in this situation. It's truly incredible that she was able to get herself to a place where she felt forgiveness and peace for herself. This is Humans. True stories about the most intriguing parts of human behaviour. The good, the bad, and the downright horrific.